Have you heard about Global Poker? Global Poker is the fastest growing card room in the US today, and it's available online at globalpoker.com. Global Poker is a social poker site that offers safe and secure cash out options by using their unique and patented sweepstakes model. Players can compete in big guaranteed tournaments, jackpot sit and goes, or cash games featuring Hold'em, Omaha, and even Crazy Pineapple. Don't wait. Check out Global Poker today. Poker Stories is an audio series that features casual interviews with some of the game's best players and personalities. Each episode highlights a well-known figure in the poker world and dives deep into their favorite tales both on and off the felt. Hello and welcome to Poker Stories, a podcast brought to you by Card Player, the Poker Authority, and hosted by me, Julio Rodriguez. This is episode number 65, featuring the one and only Jennifer Tilly. Uh, now, Jennifer is obviously not the first World Series of Poker bracelet winner I've interviewed for this podcast, but uh, she is the first Academy Award nominated actress I've had on. Uh, you may know Jennifer from her roles in movies such as uh, the Chucky series, Liar Liar, Bullets Over Broadway and Bound, or the voice work she has done for projects like Monsters, Inc. and Family Guy. But poker fans, of course, know Jennifer from her many appearances on shows such as the Celebrity Poker Showdown, uh, GSN's Poker Royale, Poker Night in America, the National Heads of Poker Championship, the Poker Superstars Invitational, High Stakes Poker, and of course, Poker After Dark. In fact, it was at a recent Poker After Dark recording that Jennifer and I recorded this podcast. Special thank you to past podcast guest Mori Eskandani for letting me borrow his studio. This was a highly entertaining interview. Jennifer talked about all sorts of subjects, including her father's um, kind of a secret life as a poker player. And uh, we got into some of her more notable films and how poker affected her career. And of course, we talked about the ultra high stakes and also very low stakes Hollywood home games. You'll even hear the story about how Phil Locke managed to win her over despite an awkward first date and some haphazard driving. Anyway, that's enough intro. Here's my conversation with Jennifer Tilly. I'm here with the lovely Jennifer Tilly. <laughs> I, I bring my own applause with me. We should, you know I go. what we're gonna do? We're gonna we're gonna add in an applause break, like oh, a thunderous are. applause break, right okay. after I say that. So, so I don't even have to do that. No, no, we're gonna leave that in too. Oh, so. fabulous! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I wish we were here under better circumstances. Mm-hmm. But uh, you have just busted out from the Poker After Dark uh, game here in Las Vegas. I know, and how humiliating! I was the first one out, mm-hmm. and um, well, that's just an efficient use of your time. If you're not gonna win. That's or right. finishing the money, get yeah, out of there, I right? could be wandering around the casino sticking money in slot machines instead of <laughs> staying here with these degenerates and <laughs> battling it out. This was a tough table, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, we were supposed to have a qualifier and another sort of television personality type. And then Well, we love to say it was tweeted publicly, right? Wasn't it? Yeah, but, you know, well, you know, we're so we're supposed to have Norm MacDonald. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, we replaced a philosopher with a shark. But actually, I don't even want to say that because Norm MacDonald is a really great player. He takes yeah, poker true. seriously. He's been playing for years. Mm-hmm. He's a very tough opponent. Yep. But, you know, I like, I like when you have a mix. Like, I like when you have people like Emmett who are super entertaining mm-hmm. or Randall Norm Emmett. MacDonald who says, yeah, Randall Emmett, who's, you know, I love sitting next to him. And the funny thing is with Norm sometimes, he doesn't even realize he's on TV, it seems. <laughs> like he'll say like the most hysterical things to me, but sort of under his breath, mm-hmm. you know? And meanwhile, there will be another conversation going on at the other end of the table. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm getting like solid gold. I'm getting like the greatest Norm MacDonald yeah, he's nuggets on, even right when he here. Have to yes, be. but nobody can eat, nobody can hear him exactly. because he just thinks of these brilliant things to say and he mumbles under his breath. <laughs> but Norm is also one of those people that's very dangerous because like Randall Emmett, he's mm-hmm. kind of batshit crazy. Like you don't really know <laughs> what's going on with yeah, him how do you and, define a range yeah and he's played in you know 
he 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 is a total DJ and he's got a lot of gamble in him. Do you so. play? Uh, you ever play with Norm in like Hollywood home games or anything? I like have. That? I play with him in my ex husband's house, mm-hmm. Sam Simon, and mm-hmm. and a couple other games too. But he's not. I don't think he's a regular on the circuit. But Sam's my favorite story about Norm is Sam said. Norm, you know, he has a bit of a gambling habit when he performs at the casinos. They're like, hey, Norm, do you want to take your paycheck and chips? And he's like, sure. (laughs) And one day he woke up and he's like, oh, my God, what am I doing with my life? I'm, you know, a brilliant comedian. I spend too much time gambling. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'm going to start a new life. And so he bought a condo by the beach and he thought, I'm going to sort of get away from, you know, the casinos and everything. He woke up the first night in his condo. And he thought, I'm hallucinating. I think I hear cards being shuffled and chips clinking. And he kind of got up like he was sleepwalking. (laughs) And he walked across the hall. And right across the hall was, you know, one of those casinos. People rent condos just to have a casino in it. Because they don't want to bring it at home around their wife. Like a makeshift pop-up casino. (laughs) It it wasn't a pop-up. It was they rented the apartment across from here for this sheer purpose of having home games and they're like norm come on in yeah. and he was like a sleepwalker he went in sat down he's like give me twenty thousand in chips and then he thought my new life is starting just like my old life just when he thought he was out they pulled him right back just in, right? when he thought he was out and you know there's a lot of people i play on the home game circuit not so mm-hmm. much anymore but you know every once in a while you'll show up the game and you, you say where's so-and-so who's a regular mm-hmm. and they say oh he's in poker rehab or poker jail because it always somebody decides that it's really not a good thing for their life they disappear for three or four months and then they're always back always come back yeah yeah but, even like the even like in the poker world the actual pros uh the ones who hit it big and say oh i'm done i'm retiring mm-hmm. you'll see them next year they'll always play the, the main thing that and then, cracks me up is when they say oh yes i'm retiring i'm not a poker player anymore and then like a month later they're like hey i'm playing in this tournament yeah and people say you retired and they go like no, I'm playing as a rat. Yeah, now I'm an amateur. I so. think if you've made more than $3 million <laughs> in poker earnings, you cannot be considered a wreck. Mm-hmm. Even <laughs> if you decided to do other things with your life, you're, you're I'm sorry, you're professional. Yeah. Oh, unless you got it all in one yeah. score, maybe. And you, you have not retired. <laughs> uh, I want to find out a little bit more about your poker origin story. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're an interesting case. Normally, we go into the background right. of all of our guests because, you know, they don't have Wikipedia pages. There you but go. your story story is out there i don't we don't need to Mm -hmm. rehash the Mm -hmm. all that but poker specifically right where what's your first memory was your dad that introduced you well when i grew up you know my parents were divorced and Mm -hmm. so i grew up with my mom and our sort of psycho stepdad dad was a car salesman we have have that you know what i have to change my wikipedia because my aunt marie goes he was not a car salesman (laughs) and you know i know my dad liked to be referred to as a stockbroker which is what he did you know the last you know 15 years of his life but my aunt marie said um no he was i don't know if he's a stockbroker he he did something else but she said um no sometimes he would trade in a car for another car so he wasn't a car salesman oh. but you know my mom would say you know a car in a, flipper in a sort of yeah a car <laughs> flipper that sounds so good but my mom would always say in sort of a derogatory way mm. oh yes your dad He's a used car salesman. I mean, we didn't know. We didn't grow up with their dad. It was just the profession that she picked to, to rag a on. A used car yeah, salesman. Not even a new which car is just salesman. what you think like a sort of hustly poker player would do for a living. And um, But it turns out it's not true. And I think my sister used to go on interviews and say, yeah, yes, my dad was a you know car salesman, mm-hmm. used car salesman. So it's in my this Wikipedia. Is your sister Meg? My sister Meg, yes. Yeah. But this is what we were told. Mm-hmm. So I really feel like as a gift to my dad <laughs> who has passed on, I really need to go in there poke around i know there's some other things in there that aren't true I, the thing with wikipedia anybody can put anything they want you in should it. have seen what i edited about you earlier today oh really <laughs> well you, here's the thing that was on my wikipedia and i took it out might have my publicist take it out mm-hmm. and put it back in take it out put it back oh in. yeah this is a question that comes up the most common misconception about you it's probably well, this right. isn't a common misconception but here I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story for anybody who hasn't heard it mm-hmm. my sister meg was famous before i was and she did a movie called invasion of the body snatchers and she didn't want to do her nude scenes and so apparently some stripper uh whose name was jennifer did the nude streams scenes but she didn't want her last name done so you look in the credits and goes meg tilly's body double 
Jennifer and some genius decided it was me, which I can't think of anything more disgusting. Like, I don't even like to do my own nude scenes. Why on earth? Can you, <laughs> how demeaning? I would go on the set and be my sister's nude body double. But it, this is your younger sister, right? My younger sister, yeah. Meg, yeah. But it was well, that's in at least there. A compliment, Even when I though, went on right? Jay Leno, he was going <laughs> to ask you, ask me about it. And they're like, and you were your sister's nude body double. How was that? They're, I'm like, what? That was the first I ever heard of it. <laughs> but um, no, and actually at that time, my career, I'd starred in several movies myself. So yeah. like, why am I going to waste time being like, oh, it's a little slow period. I'm going to pick up 50 bucks just to be my sister's nude body double. Just a, a favorite of your sister, Yeah, just you know? like fun, 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 fun. It's one of those kind of weird things like when they have have like you know the playboy the sisters pictorial and they're both like naked like i know you want both of us it's, it seems weirdly it's a little weird incestual. when you think about it it's yeah. a little hard <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh but your mother yes. patricia mm -hmm. was an actress oh, oh right? okay i forgot i i always get off the track well no i was just trying to make the connection oh, so I was like, say, oh yes between your acting side and your gambling side right, right. which i yes. thought came from your father yeah and i didn't finish the gambling thing my stories get really <laughs> really long so feel free to this interrupt this podcast me is all tangents Don't my, worry. my friend and i go we we circle around we go all the way around the block and you know sometimes we go to the next um province and then we come back to where we were at but um yes my mom was she used to sing in gilbert and sullivan operettas okay and she had all the records and we used to walk around the house singing i know like all the parts and all because we didn't have tv which gets us to the card playing mm -hmm. so every friday night was card night so we would get that we had a very big family and we'd all sit around the table and we play fan tan and what are these other games hearts and uh, i think this game called spades we played everything mm -hmm. except poker which is odd that's the only game we didn't play family games yeah family games but i remember i really loved cards and i was very good at it and i was very competitive and um then i dated a guy a, a rat packer actor type and he had like a monday night poker game is this lou oh uh, yeah i dated lou diamond phillips for mm -hmm. a bit um because he's you know, playing the World Series of yes, Poker. Yes, yes. He made a deep run in the main event a few years ago, I yeah. believe. Uh, well, he had a Monday night poker game, and it was all the guys, you know, all his friends, like, mm -hmm. you know, David Schwimmer, and I don't know if George, George Clooney was one of his gang. I don't know if he played then. Um, That's before he was famous. So I said the, I wanted... The General Hospital? Not General Hospital, uh, uh, ER days. Uh, yeah, no, it was pre-ER. Pre oh, wow. Because George used to hang around at Lou's house and play pool and everything like mm -hmm. that. And, you know, Lou always had a whole bunch of guys, like, hanging out. You know, he liked doing the guy stuff. So I was like... I want to play poker on Monday night. So I asked him if he could teach me how to play poker. So he did. And then he didn't realize that then I was expecting that I would come and play. Oh. So I played a couple times and then all of a sudden it was sort of like, oh, you know. You were the only girl? Yeah. But he was like, oh, you know, it's kind of like a guy's night. So <laughs> I, had, I started my own poker game. So every time I would be on the sets, I'd teach everyone how to play poker. Mm -hmm. And in between scenes, i play with the Teamsters for my per diem. Yeah. And those guys were tough. They'll take your money, you know. And <laughs> And then I met Phil, and I actually met him at the Celebrity Poker Tournament that's on um, well, Sam the didn't WPT. Play, I know Sam played cards too, right? Yeah, but he played after we were divorced, and, oh, and okay. I think he kind of got interested. I just you got him into it. No, he, I might have, because he got interested in poker mm -hmm. after I did. Like, we never played when we were married or anything like that. I think the poker boom, a lot of people got interested in yeah. poker, and Sam was a very analytical guy, and I had, he actually played in my little poker game that I got started, mm -hmm. which we've been playing for 20 years, it's called the Key West game, you buy it for 20 bucks, it's like <laughs> limit poker, you know, 25 cent, 50 raise, um, 50 cent raise, you can bet $2. Those are the most the fun games. They're so fun because You cannot nobody, match that fun in a casino yeah, environment. Nobody gets mean? hurt, we always make the same jokes, you always know what to expect. I always make my like if I did something once I thought oh I'll do something different and you know I made like uh, I, I made Kentucky Fried Chicken everybody goes where's the Tilly Chili so we like to do we do the same joke all the time every and we've been well, what's that so game special about years. your Tilly Chili I need to know the well I don't know my it's my dad's recipe it mm -hmm. has like ground you put ground pork in it so that gives it ground pork ground beef onion garlic a lot of beer, like about two thirds oh. of a bottle of beer, and about half a cup of red wine. So it's probably the alcohol. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna mix this together, not knowing the proportions. I'm a see very how it turns good out. I'm a very good chili maker. <laughs> so anyway, then at the World Poker Tour, you know, remember everybody on the Travel Channel? I was like, oh, and I actually saw Phil on TV before I met him. Phil Locke, my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And oh, I he had already won his WPT. No, he hadn't won it. Oh, okay. He but he had been on television and. I remember there was one hand where there was 
I think he was trying to calculate pot odds and he was sort of, you know, on his haunches, mm -hmm. like, you know, like a vulture and everything. And he goes, hold on a second, what's in the pot? And then I swear to God, watching it, I heard clicking noises like wheels in his brain going click, 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 click. <laughs> and I went, that man is really intelligent. I was just <laughs> impressed, not by his look, but by the sound that his brain made when it was working. And so um, I met him at the celebrity poker tournament, the WPT one, but I went out on the first day and he went on to win it. So oh, okay. yeah. anyhow, he didn't manage to get my phone number that time because I'm Jennifer Tilly. It's like at the end of the evening, when people would say, yeah, can I have he... your phone number? I would say, give me your number yeah. and I'll call you. And then at the Or end of... here's my publicist number. I wouldn't say my publicist <laughs> number, but you know, you never know what kind of flotsam and jetsam you're going to pick up at the mm -hmm. Commerce Casino. So at the end of the night, I remember that night I had a <laughs> bunch of phone numbers. Apparently Phil's was one of them. I went, who are these people? <laughs> and I crumbled them in a ball and I threw them in the trash. And about four months later, I ran into him again at a poker tournament, the Hard Rock you know, the charity poker tournament. And he ended up getting my phone number then. And actually what happened was- You were attracted to him, right? I wasn't attracted to him. It, it was the poker? No, I, I wanted to meet a poker player because I thought, well, I fancy myself quite, quite the fabulous poker player. I wanted, like I have a habit of, like I have so many gay men friends and I have a habit of taking men that are interested in me and making them platonic friends. And just like, you know, <laughs> let's like, you know, why have sex? Let's just hang out. Let's not complicate things. So I want to be in my friend zone. Oh yeah, in friend, I friend zone pretty much everybody. And I was sort of like, I want a guy to take me down to the casino and then we can play. You know, I don't want to go to the casino by myself. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was looking for. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, Phil could be that person. Show you the ropes. But when he asked me for my phone number, I you probably heard this story before. He goes, he goes, how can I get a hold of you again? And I said, oh, give me your phone number. I'll call you. And he said, that's what you said the last time. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed that I was doing the same line twice because I didn't even remember saying that to him before. <laughs> he said, tell you what. Why don't you give me your phone number? Because it's only 3% y'all call me, but it's 100% I'll call you. What a line. I know. And I was like, uh. And we were at a poker <laughs> table. And Phil said he had practiced that line from when he ran into me again, but he didn't realize it was going to be at a poker table with all his friends staring at him. He was just like really embarrassed to be caught macking that is, a girl. That like, is taking a shot. You know, know what I mean? taking a shot. And he had to leave because he, his playing was taking off. So I gave him my phone number and the rest as they say is history yeah but actually the first date okay the first date i was like this is the craziest date i've ever been on yeah what is what is phil's first well, date move well first of all it doesn't look like a dinner and a this movie was guy. way before anybody did it he would google everything and he googled a restaurant near me and then he googled how to get there and i've been lived in la <laughs> for like 30 years it's like who googles how to get to a restaurant like i just thought that was really weird then he's a terrible driver and he would be like just driving a lot you'd be talking and i'd be going through stop signs and i'd be like oh that's just a stop sign he's like oh 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 and then we'd be talking and then he'd be like floating through a red light i go phil we're going through a red light and go oh and he'd go honk so people could tell he's going through the red light and then on the way home from the date we're on the freeway going 60 miles an hour he had this huge old pontiac it's like a boat like a really old 1960s pontiac and he's telling me about the perfect he wanted to play this perfect song it was a leonard cohen song he said and he goes um hey jennifer can you take the wheel so i can find this song, this CD to plug in, the perfect romantic song that's gonna make me fall in love with him. And I was horrified, we're on the freeway, and you know, I'm way over there and he's way over here. And I go, I will not, I was so scared for my life. And he goes, oh, he goes, oh, I, I thought someone should hold on to the wheel, but never mind. He took both hands off his wheel and started rummaging around in this box looking for the, looking for the CD and I'm like oh my god I'm gonna die but Phil when I tell that story he gets very indignant and he goes I was steering with my knees yeah of course like that's a different it's way better all I see is a guy with no hands on the wheel going 60 miles away a mile on the freeway then he drives he's driving me home he doesn't want it to be over I really want it to be over and he drives <laughs> on the wrong side of the street and he sort of parks and I'm like we're on the wrong side we're on the wrong side because we're facing oncoming traffic and because and he goes oh they'll see me coming they'll see my lights no one's going to crash into us 
I'm like, but we're in the wrong lane <laughs> facing the traffic. So anyway, I, I sort of took a stab at it. I still thought maybe perhaps I could meet him at the Commerce Casino because my mind was saying, you must never get in a car with this man ever, ever, ever again. <laughs> and I thought, I was like, hey, maybe we can go to the casino kind of sometime. He's like, oh, you know, I can set you up. He goes, I can set you up with a Poker Stars account. You know, you should probably play online before you go playing with real people. He goes, I can come inside right now and set up your Poker Stars account. And of course, the little voice in my head is, you must not let this man in your house. <laughs> He'll never <laughs> leave. So anyway, a couple of days later, I was telling my friends the stories and they were laughing and laughing. And I go, they go, oh, you wonder what he was like. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we saw him on the WPT when he won the celebrity tournament. Remember he is shadow boxing and doing yeah, yeah. push-ups and running around the table and he like he was like a crazy man but i hadn't seen it so i didn't know he was like a mini celebrity now but i love being the center of attention telling all these stories and that's only like a, sm a smidgen of the stories i had about that night because he's a crazy man um <laughs> i was like well i'll go out with him just one more time to get some material and then he hooked me on the second time yeah yeah he did a better job the second time huh the second time, I just kind of remember we were approaching, uh, oh, Antonio just won the LAPC. Oh, yes. The whole. Ooh. Yeah. So Phil calls me up. I'm walking along the street with my friend. Um, hey, so Antonio, like, like, like we're married or something. Antonio just, he, and you know, he, he never says hello or anything like that. He assumes you know who he is. Antonio just won a turn. He rented, he's getting he, a club and he's getting a limo and I'll be at your house in like 40 minutes. I'm like, what? Who is this? And I'm like, and it's Friday and he's not only asking me out the same day, he's saying, I'll be at your house in 40 minutes. And I go, oh, I'm afraid that that's not true. Uh, that, that's not going to happen. I, I have plans. I, I'm having dinner with my friend and my friend is like, and I go, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm busy. So I hang up. And my friend goes, well, well, you should go out with him. You like him, right? I was like, well, I'm not sure about that. And she said, <laughs> I said, well, he should call me like a week ahead of time. She goes, you know, people don't, the young kids, they don't do that anymore. Phil's a little bit younger than me. <laughs> She's like, <laughs> and all of a sudden the phone rings again. And um, Phil's like a little more polite now. He's like, um, um, Jennifer, um, you know, you can have dinner with your friend and then go home and get, and then I will come and pick you up. We don't have to be in the limo with Antonio. And my friend's like, say yes, say yes. So I was like, oh, all right. But, you know, I need an hour and a half, like more time than I need, just so I save my dignity. And so then he shows up and then we're approaching the club. And, you know, I'm kind of an old person at this point. I haven't been in a club for, you know, and I see all these like really hot girls and hot pants, like half my age and looking all cute. And I think like, Oh, those girls are so much younger and cuter than me. And it was like he read my mind. He goes, um, he looks at me and he goes, did I tell you how, how beautiful you look tonight? And I was like, oh, I just felt like he knew I was insecure. And he was like telling me like. He had to read. I liked really, he had to read. Also on our first date, we saw this movie. Um, it was The Born Identity. Okay. And there's an actress named Joan somebody, Joan Allen. Mm -hmm. And she's playing the big mucky muck, the uptight director of mm -hmm. the CIA. And I was very inter interested in this because she had like a very like sort of like general suit on. But she had all this sort of bouncing, behaving, well a balsam hair, like just this sexy in the bedroom hair. And I remember looking at it thinking like, was that her idea? Like, does this actress, is one of the most brilliant actresses, does she have like that much vanity that she still wants to look cute even though she's even supposed though to be a hard Even though she's a CIA director, yeah. Or I thought, is this the producers going, because sometimes the producers go. Sex them up. Yeah, she looks like a man. You make, give her more hair. So I remember thinking it was just a weird thing. And just then Phil leaned over and he said to me, he whispered in my ear, I don't believe her hair. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe a guy is thinking the same Not thing. Not only a I guy, am. but just somebody out of the industry. You and, know what I mean? As an actress, you notice that you right. can't even watch TV without noticing and stuff like that. And years later, we ran into Brian Koppelman. I think mm -hmm. he had something to do with that. He wrote her or something like that. 
Or or he called. No, I remember. We this ran was into, uh, one of the rounders. Creators. Yeah, no. Yeah, he actually didn't. We ran into Brian Koppelman and he put Matt Damon on the phone. Mm -hmm. And Matt Damon, he said to Matt Damon, just the question about Joan Allen's hair. And Matt Damon started laughing. He goes, you would not believe what a huge thing it cost on the set. <laughs> Everybody said she shouldn't have that hair, but she was determined to have that hair. He goes, mm -hmm. I cannot believe you <laughs> noticed that. It was a huge thing. So anyway, I just, yes, I, I fell for Phil. And, you know, there... And, and here I am, 17 years later, <laughs> in, in a studio playing poker. So. Exactly. And I think a lot of it, like, honestly, he taught me how to play poker. And we used to travel around and follow the poker tournament circuit. And it was pretty intense for a while. But now we like to stay home more. So mm -hmm. it settled down a little bit. But I really... Well, you know, how are you as a student? Uh, because some people are bad teachers. Some people are bad students. You know, uh, how's Phil's a... An instructor, an instructor. I would say Phil's a bad teacher, and I'm a bad student. <laughs> That's about to say a lot of couples right, can't right. do that. Can't, you know what I mean? Actually, in the beginning, he was very, very good, and he mm -hmm. gave me a lot of books to read, and he explained a lot about poker to me and everything. And then there comes a point because I'm very competitive, and I'm competitive with Phil, where I got really stubborn and I dig in my heels, and I'm like, no, I want to play, I want to do it my way. So then it became a very sort of prickly thing where he's trying, you know, Phil is a much better poker player yeah. than I am, but he's trying to so gently tell like, me yeah. about yeah, pot odds and playing in position and stuff like that. And I'm like, you play your way and I'll play my way. <laughs> yeah, it has to come from a different messenger. It, it really does. My <laughs> mom always said, like, when I wanted to learn how to drive, she says, you have to go to driving school. He said, she said, because... If your boyfriend or your sister or I'm teaching you, then you get sort of because it's too personal. Mm -hmm. Come in, it's Randall oh, Emmett. He's yeah. banging on the door. He wants oh. to know what's going on. He left. Oh, he went away. <laughs> I, I guess they are. I, I think he was looking for something or someone, and we were not the people he's looking for. Oh, so anyway, uh, yeah. So Phil, and this is the thing too. Is like I just always wanted to start off like. Big. Like I never wanted to play in the kiddie pool, which is probably you know it's a character flaw of mine. Well, and you had that twenty dollar home game. I did have the twenty dollar home game, but like after I became a professional, semi professional poker player, mm -hmm. I would try to fold, and everyone jeer at me. They go, "Why did you fold?" Because in our home game, everybody just play. They think poker is you play till the end, and then you see who has the best hand. Mm -hmm. So, and I would say, "Well, it's negative equity to stay in." They're like, "Ooh, negative equity! Look at you with your big poker terms." And then I realized. Yeah, my Get game. out of here. <laughs> yeah, it's like tiddlywinks. Or I had to look at like Monopoly. Or, and mm -hmm. also, too, they're crazy games. There's like 27. We play baseball. There's like 27 wild cards. And, you know, the game where you stick the card on your forehead and everybody laughs. So I thought, I just can't play it seriously like I would play regular yeah. regular poker. Well, let me ask you about uh, those mm -hmm. celebrity poker players you encountered. You mentioned Matt Damon. Mm -hmm. He famously had a hand at the World Series of Poker. We had Kings versus Aces preflop. Was that? I the don't one? remember the exact mm -hmm. action, but right. he was very clearly trying to act weaker than he was, mm -hmm. and it was very transparent. Here we have an Oscar nominated, uh, you know, yeah. winner, and like uh, everyone can read him like a book. It's like mm -hmm. painfully obvious on TV. Uh, so did you find it weird going up against playing against actors and when they were trying to like feign weakness or I don't, I don't did know. did you find certain people were better at it? It seems like comedians tend to be better players than dramatic actors. There are some poker. Yeah, I think so. There's some poker players, um, celebrity poker players that are really good, you know, pretty mm -hmm. good. And then there's some celebrity poker players that are good for celebrities. Mm -hmm. And um, I just think it's like. It's really good for the poker community that celebrities like to play poker mm -hmm. and that they like to play poker on TV and they have their home games and everything. I play, like when I play, I don't really play with a lot of celebrities. So um, let's th see the ones I play with. I play with Ben Affleck once. He's, you know, he has a California State Poker Championship yeah, the game I played it was, belt. you know, Jacob, the little Jacob that has uh, mm -hmm. in the wheelchair, and he, Jacob Zaleski. Zaleski, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he has the... the, the All in for cerebral palsy. Yeah, yeah, the charity tournament every year. Yep. So Sam was a friend of his, and Sam called me up, and he was like, he goes, Jennifer, I'm throwing a little game for... Sam didn't have me in his regular game. I don't know if he didn't want me to see what a DJ and he was. <laughs> and But he said, I'm having a game for Jacob, and it's going to be like a $1, $2 game so he can play, and you want to come, you know? 
And I go to Phil, let me twenty thousand dollars. And Phil said, I thought you said it was a one dollar, two dollar game. And I go, Yes, it is, but I hear Ben Affleck's gonna be here, there and I hear he's a big degenerate. I said, I bet you would play one dollar, two dollar for about you know an hour and then we're gonna They'll play step real it poker. Up. Yeah. Yeah. So Phil let me twenty thousand dollars and I went over there with my big bulging purse and it was Norm MacDonald was there and um, Ben but I got there a little bit late I got there about forty five minutes late because I honestly thought I was going to be going till four in the morning and Ben was like he just newly married to Jen Garner I think he's trying to keep his nose clean because he was only playing one dollar two dollar and then he was on the phone he's going we're almost done I'm I'm leaving mm -hmm. soon I'm leaving and he was saying I have to leave at ten o'clock or whatever it was yeah. some really early hour and then he left so I'm like. I didn't really see Ben Affleck. I didn't play with the actual Ben Affleck. Yeah. I played with sort of, you know, a hologram <laughs> of Ben Affleck, as it were. But then it is really true. Jacob went to bed. Well, he didn't go to bed. His, um, you know, his helper was trying to put him to bed, but he was so happy he didn't want to go to bed. And then it became a big D-Gen fest. Norm MacDonald was playing that night. And literally, <laughs> there were some hands that there was like $30,000 pots. Well, I think people, you know, when they have a, when they picture a Hollywood home game, they're picturing that opening scene of Ocean's Eleven where mm. Brad Pitt is mm. talking with like, you know, Topher Grace and. Well, there's like there's some girls that play, you know, like high powered girls that have a, a home game, which I have not played in that. Um, but I would say most of the games that I go to, which I would call Hollywood games, there's sort of is a lot of the people in it were in the book Molly's game. Mm -hmm. Molly's game was before my time. Like I heard about Molly, but I didn't play that. This high is like the Alex then. Rodriguez games, the the yeah. Toby Maguire, you know. Yeah, but I, I've never played with Toby Maguire either. But a lot of the guys who were in that book, I used to play with on a very regular basis, and they don't really want pros there. So I feel like even if I became like the greatest poker player in the world. I've always, I will always be welcome because I'm Bride of Shockey. And because, you know, sometimes I've misplaced some hands on TV. You have your foot in both worlds. I do have my foot in both worlds. And I really like that I was invited to these games. But Phil is like, <laughs> I thought it was quite an accomplishment that I, because I really set out to make sure that I could get into these games. But then Phil thought, he he was you know feels really protective of me so he didn't think it was accomplished you know when you can get into those games it's actually kind of an insult because it means that they think you're a giant fish but i used to love playing these games i became a total dj and i was playing about four nights a week and it would be mm -hmm. the same game that would go on at different like monday it would be at one person's house and then tuesday the game it's all the same guy yeah. so if you lose on monday you pay somebody on wednesday a lot of times there was uh when that scandal went down the alex ruderman scandal the guy with the hedge fund that was playing a toby mcguire's game yeah. with his clients money you know it's very unfair that the government said like said oh you guys have to get this money back because it's stolen money is, hello, if somebody steals it's some money, money and goes though. to Walmart and buys a, a lawnmower, you know, you're not They don't going, ask Walmart for the money back. They don't ask him for the money back. But like Toby and some people settle because it's just embarrassing press. Like, Yeah, and they yeah. don't think about the money in that way. It's just like... But there was one guy that said, uh, um, actor, a very famous actor, director person I know, and he said, I am fighting it. He goes, I can fight this. And I said, how? He said, I never played with that guy. He said, I got past the check. And that's this when you play in these home games, sometimes you'll get a check for a huge amount of money with somebody you don't even know who it is. But there was this one guy that used they just to, endorse it over, right? Yeah. There was one guy that he you no, know, they just they're like they're like, if you're owed a lot of money, you get like checks from different different people because they just pass it around. But there was one time I had a really big win and I got this huge check from this guy that used to show up at the regular game until everybody saw like you know he's really really rich and really really bad so some of these guys created a bigger game wow they poached him they poached him but the guys in the game the same game i was playing and they would rent a suite in las vegas they put him on a private plane they'd fly him someplace to like wow. aruba or whatever to get him away from the regular people so i remember this guy i loved when he'd show up like i'd be really stuck about two in the morning all of a sudden <laughs> he'd show up and i'd be back to even in like six minutes <laughs> but he loved he loved poker he was he, he was really fun to play with but i said i really think that there was like i think his money was like i don't know it might have been drug money or money laundering <laughs> money or something like that and when i got this check they're like you need to hold on to it for a week before you deposit and i said look i don't have the privilege of playing with this guy i don't want to be past his like shady checks that i might the government might say you have to give me that check back because it's yeah. stolen money so it's like if i'm not playing with this guy i don't want to accept his check so i did actually write a short story 
There's a book called He Played for His Wife and Other Stories. And um, I wrote a short story and it's about my it's sort of about my home game experiences. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I changed all the names and everything and I sort of fictionalized certain elements of it. But it is a very unique thing, you know. Oh, the reason I stopped doing those games is I was such a DJ. I remember once I stayed awake. All I played all the way till twelve o'clock the next day, and then I drove down the hill and went to a rehearsal. Well, that's all about and to I ask. Was pale. Like, I was like, I just lost this amount of money, and everyone's like, "Okay, now we're gonna sing and we're gonna sing a song, and then we're gonna do a little sketch, and you know." And I was just like, "Oh my God, I'm the world's biggest." I actually had a license plate that said D Gen with a J. D Gen, I like yeah, that. Yeah, and the guys used to laugh. I show up at the poker game with my my <laughs> Bentley and my license plate said D Gen. And actually, after that night when I lost so much money, I thought, "Why am I proud of that?" It's like it's almost like a negative affirmation. Why do I think it's funny to be a D Gen? And you know what? Oh, I'm getting back to my dad. Okay, so when <laughs> my dad, my dad, full passed, circle. When my dad passed away, and I never knew this about them, my dad gave me a game. It was a, a video game. It was a great game. I loved it. It's called The World Series of Poker. Okay. And you go like a handheld game, or no? It was you put in your computer. It's like a little DVD. In fact, James McManus talks about in his book that he used to practice mm -hmm. on that. And I, I remember I just played and played and played and played, and all of a sudden. A little man came on screen he said congratulations you've made it to the second day i was like oh my god i didn't even know there was a second day <laughs> and then i played for another six months and then he said you've made it to the third day and i was like the third day and then they go he goes you've made it to the final table and they have like a cartoon of doyle brunson and doyle brunson goes welcome like that in wow. like a little cartoon voice and then after i met phil one day I won the World Series of Poker and the screen filled up with money and there was a gold bracelet on top. And then after that, I won it two or three more times. And I, I said casually to Phil, like, oh, I won the well, video. He goes, that proves nothing. He goes, that proves that you finally figured out the computer's algorithm. <laughs> I thought it proved that I was Come on, Phil, let her have this. I beat Doyle Brunson at the <laughs> final table in my simulated <laughs> poker game. But that day I wrote down, one day I'm going to go to the real world series of poker and win a real gold bracelet. And before about, Phil. Before. <laughs> I did actually win it before Phil. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you know, and Phil can't play the ladies tournament, so yeah. I had a little advantage. But... um. Yeah, so it was weird. And then the first year I went to the World Series of Poker, I won the gold bracelet. And I wish that my dad could have seen it because, oh, when I was, when we were playing that game, my dad and me, my his um, wife, my step stepmom would get really upset. She'd be like, dinner's on the table. But then I found out after he passed away, he had a quote unquote poker problem. And oh. I had no idea. So I think she was thinking he was getting all caught up in sort of the degeneracy. And I remember in my family, they're all like, don't lend, don't lend Harry. My dad's name was Harry. Don't lend Harry money. There was that. And so after he passed away, she said, I'm clearing out his, uh, his book collection. And I knew you like uh, poker. And here's a book that belonged to him. And it was Sklansky's Theory of Poker. And it was wow. from like 1969. A first edition. It was all dog-eared and highlighted. It was the Bible at that point. It was minus the Bible. Super system. And it was, I think the price was like something like a hundred dollars. hundred bucks, yeah. Like he got it from the back pages of Esquire because it had all the poker secrets for a paperback book in like 1969. And when I went to the celebrity tournament, I found Skolansky. He They go, he's over there. And I had him autograph it. He goes, oh, my God, I haven't seen this in ages. Where did you get it? <laughs> so then I found out that he used to play poker all the time. My mom said, when I would take you kids to see your grandmother, he would go down to Vegas and gamble. So I think you have genetic markers for gambling, just like you do for alcoholism or uh, acting. Or acting. <laughs> well, acting's not, acting yeah. is not a, a It's a learned though. trade, I guess. Or yeah. drugs or something. Yeah. And then, because I'm starting to learn a lot, I'm half Chinese. My dad was Chinese about the Chinese side of my family. And you know, gambling is so old in the Chinese culture. The first deck of cards was invented in like the 11th century in China. But superstitious culture as well. So I'm very superstitious. Very also. based on luck, numbers. Yes. Yeah. yes, and I see a lot of I see ghosts, which you know the Chinese people they do. If the ghosts are there, they'll see them. Um, real, real live ghost, y'all. So um, <laughs> anyway, then my aunt Marie told me a story last summer, which I thought was very interesting. She said when my great grandparents came over to America for the first time in the 1920s, 
she said they came first class, not steerage. That meant they were very, very mm-hmm. wealthy for yeah. a Chinese family to travel first class. And then my grandfather, he went to the UCLA Medical School in the 1920s to study to be a doctor. And he had to cut his study short and fly back to China. Why? His brother had gambled away the family fortune. Man. Which got, must have been sizable. It runs deep. Yes. Yeah, so, and I had no idea like what a degenerate I was, but I'm super, um, I'm really aggressive and I'm kind of fearless. And I'm not saying that proudly, but you know, I would say po- uh, poker is just dick measuring and nobody has a bigger dick than me basically <laughs> i do not want to back down it's just like a crazy game of chicken yeah which is like today when emma was oh i, I call him emma, randall when randall was i was betting i was raising he was betting he was raising he had nothing i had sort of next to nothing but you just know the 10-8 hand or yeah no when i had i had yeah, I had a 10-8, and the flop came with a jack-8 something or another, mm-hmm. and a bat, and then the turn came with another jack. So now I know Randall doesn't have another jack. And I bet, after raising him on the flop, and then I let out, and then he basically put me all in. And then all of a sudden, my second pair didn't seem too great. And then, of course, he laughed and showed a bluff. And then I went on mad tilt, and I was out like 10 minutes later. <laughs> That's my problem. Is so Antonio said to me, Jeremy, you're a really good poker player, but when you go on tilt, then it's really bad and it's true i just did tornado of downward what are your uh, do you have any tilt uh deflection um, he, antonio techniques? told me to get up and walk away from the table for about 20 minutes 20 is a lot in a tournament though 50 well not in a tournament he's yeah. in a cash game he says just get up and walk away from the table and cool down which is was actually very very good advice but actually the last game i played with antonio antonio had his calvicade of fish you know and he sent out a little message like because they used to have a second table for the cash game so if anybody busted out then all of a sudden you're stuck with like yeah, yeah. you you know somebody you don't want to be playing poker with so he said look everybody you have to promise that if you get busted out you'll rebuy and you won't leave because we don't want those pros in our game hello says the pro is pro of them all which is antonio <laughs> he just wanted like all all his like happy rich businessmen in the thing and i did go on tilt when i when later on i had um pocket kings and i hit a set and he goes do you want to chop no he goes do you want to run it twice and i usually never run it twice I felt sorry for him because I had such a monster and there was so much money in the middle. I kind of didn't notice there was a flush draw on board. And he said, I go, sure. I thought it'd be nice and, you know, run it twice. I was like, what harm can it do? And then he hit a flush on the second one. And then I was like, and then after that, I was sort of off and running. Like, what did I say? I'd run it twice. I never run it twice. I was ahead. I would have taken it all down. All these hands are happening, and you're still thinking about that one. And... Yeah, and it is. It's sort of like a snowball rolling yeah, downhill. Yeah. It just gains momentum. And you know, I'm sure all poker players deal with that. But I think the ones that are really good, you know, have like ice water running in their veins. They just don't let emotion get in the way. Yeah. And I think it's probably harder for people like myself or you know like sometimes recreational players you feel like you have something to prove and you feel like somebody made a monkey out of you or you know and then i think that that sort of accelerates the process yeah yeah when you have to when poker becomes more about revenge than Mm -hmm. winning the pot revenge i mean honestly in a tournament if i suffer a bad beat like let's say i lose half my stat I'll just go on a raging tear and I'm either out in the next five minutes or I have doubled my chips or tripled my chips. But I get this adrenaline that kicks in and it's just like sort of this weird competitive rage like uh, (laughs) scorched earth policy. I think we all suffer from that. All of you guys, you know. We all get that from time to time, but it sounds like you might be uh, a little more than most. Uh, yeah. You might have to do the rubber band around the wrist uh, uh, reminder kind of thing, right? Right. But actually, honestly... I love a poker game when I go on tilt. When I say, okay, you are the one that I'm, that, but it's odd. When I say, when you'll see me on televised um, games going, you have a target on you. You're the, I'm, I'm going to get you. And, the, yeah, yeah. and they're laughing, of course, because it's like, you know, a little kid, like, you know, kicking the elephant or something. And I'm, but, but a lot of times, the one person that you, are going against that's the one that knocks you out or Mm -hmm. takes all your money because now they have the they know that you want to get them and it's almost like judo or is it karate where you take the strength of the guy rushing at you and you use his own strength to flip him on his back 
So that's why I think that why it happens so much. I'm sure a lot of people listening will say, yes, why is the one guy that I hate at the table the guy that ended up knocking me out? And that's why. Yeah, exactly. Mm Because you're trying too hard to get to get back. Yes. Uh, You mentioned, you know, that you would sometimes, you know, play all night and go into rehearsals, you know, still thinking about poker. Obviously, you've been working this entire time while still playing poker. Have you, have you ever turned down a gig for oh, poker? Oh, yeah. I actually haven't really been working that much. The thing is, poker sort of coincided with you get to a certain age in Hollywood and the work kind of dries up. But it was my own fault, too, because I sort of let the acting fall by the wayside because I was so fascinated by the poker. And, you know... I used to say, you know how there's a grandmaster in chess? I wanted to be a grandmaster in poker. I think it's really, really difficult, though. You have to devote so much time to so much study. And also, too, even stamina. Like, I'm not 20 years old. And, you know, your mind sometimes, you know, calcifies. (laughs) (laughs) I feel it at 34, so. (laughs) Right. But I I just really did. I, I had did turn down a lot of things to play poker. But things I didn't really want to do. Mm-hmm. But if I didn't have poker in my world, I'd be like, oh, I'm kind of bored. I might as well go off to Romania, you know, make this sort of action thriller or whatever. But I found there was a period of time where I realized that I like poker better than acting. Mm-hmm. And I would say, do I want to do this? You know, do I want to wake up in, at five in the morning and eat cold burritos and, you know, this low budget movie that may or may not make it to the Toronto Film Festival? Or do I want to play poker? And usually it's like, I'd rather play poker. And I felt like, well I've done that I've done the acting and and but now I've sort of pivoted a little bit because like I said I don't really play the home games anymore well I just feel like you're you're, you're being a little modest about your your resume I, I see a ton of credits in the last 10 years or so 15 years since the poker boom really yeah including a lot of voice work obviously mm-hmm. um did you like your voice growing up or because obviously it's very I had unique. no I, I had no idea I had a funny voice not I wouldn't call at, it funny. I mean, no, it's but just I have a tri- recognizable. A unique, a unique voice. And I had no idea because it comes out of my... In fact, I even thought I had a low voice. But especially in the early 80s, I could make it... You know how Tiffany the doll talked? I can make it sound like this. You know, so it was sort of a thing where people kind of loved it or hated it. Be like, hi, how, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. But now um, I... But people would say, like, the people call me telemarketers, and I'd answer the phone, and they'd go, oh, hello, little girl, is your mom at home? <laughs> and I'd think, and I'd go, no. And they'd go, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll call back later when That's the right there. answer. Yes. Yeah, so then I realized I did have sort of a voice like a little girl, and I've done a lot of cartoons mm-hmm. now. I do Bonnie and Family Guy, which I've been doing for, I don't know, about 20 years now. And, mm-hmm. you know, I've done four... four uh, Chucky movies playing the voice of Tiffany the doll. Well, my daughter asked me where I was going, and I told her I was uh, I was going to go interview Mike Wazowski's girlfriend. Right, Mike Wazowski. Right, that's like, my favorite restaurant. We actually they there. She's like uh, the one with one eye. The one with one <laughs> eye. Well, you know, so many people would say to me, "Oh, can you sit talk to my little girl?" And they would be like. They would be like, this is Celia. And they'd look at me and they'd start to cry. They'd be like, no, <laughs> Celia has one eye and snakes for her hair. This girl's ugly. Yeah. But on the phone, they get And she was contaminated they at would the sushi just, restaurant. Yes, they would just hear the voice. And so <laughs> they'd be very enthralled because people would make me call and talk to their kids. But it would just like boggle the mind if they would, you know, a three-year-old come up to me and they'd say, this is Celia. Yeah. And they'd be like, no, she's not. You can, Why are you lying to me? You can't fool me. Well, but, what, like, let's say you're 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 walking down the street. We're actually doing a television series now. There's a monster mm-hmm. television th- series coming up. Oh, awesome! That's a great thing about the great thing about um, voiceover. You can be the same. Like I've been doing Bonnie for 20 years. You know, 20 years later, they're coming back. They still want me to be Celia. I'm like, sure. Your voice doesn't change. Tiffany, I've been. Mm-hmm. It's easy to do Tiffany the doll, but um, Don Mancini creates the Tiffany movies. I keep being. Tiffany, and then Jennifer in Seed of Chuck House, Jennifer Tilly, and then Tiffany goes into Jennifer Tilly's body, so now I'm Tiffany in Jennifer Tilly's body, and then the next one, I forget what it's called, Curse of Chucky, I show up, but I'm Tiffany again, but I'm in Jennifer <laughs> Tilly's body. And the last one, I was also walking around Tiffany, and then also at the end of the movie, there's the doll Tiffany, so I was doing both of the voices. In Seed of Chucky, I was Jennifer Tilly, the actress, and Tiffany, the doll, and I'd be having conversations with myself, I'd be like, oh, oh my God, who are you? 
you. This is getting real meta. And they'd be like, <laughs> I'm your biggest fan, Miss Tilly. Can I have your autograph? So I was doing both characters. So, but yeah, it's kind of hard now because the last movie that we do is, was called Cult of Chucky. I was supposed to be Tiffany, but the same age that Tiffany was when she surfaced, which was like 23 years ago. So it was really, it's really hard. I feel like Wendy and Peter Pan, the book, not the movie, which I have a scene where he comes back to get her. He, he says, I'll get you next year. And then he comes back next year. And then a few years go by. And then he forgets like, you know, 12 years go by and he shows up and now she's a grown woman. And she's sort of he goes, Wendy, Wendy, it's time to go to Never Neverland. She's yeah. sort of crouching down and trying to make herself small so he won't see that she grew up. And that's why I sort of feel like when Don, Don calls me, he's like, Jennifer, I wrote a new script and you're Tiffany the person. I'm like, mm, it's, <laughs> I was so long in the tooth to play Tiffany the person. But, you know, I'll do it as long as Don wants to write me the part. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you get most when you're walking down the street and people stop you? Chucky, uh, every, I never, ever thought. Like, I've made so many films, and pretty much I'd say nine out of ten people, and the Chucky fans, they're like Chucky fans. They're the best mm -hmm. fans in the whole world. And yeah, you go to, like, horror conventions and I stuff. Don't. Like, uh, well, I don't. Well, I mean, like, that's the well, kind of cred you have in yeah, that world. Yeah, but a lot of the other Chucky people do, but mm -hmm. I kind of don't have to. Yeah. But, you know, I love to meet my fans and everything, but I feel like... I don't know. I kind of don't want to charge them for to sign an autograph and everything. So I send out. I have a guy who does a, a service. Mm -hmm. So I give everyone a signed picture for free because you know I really appreciate that they're my fans and you know I don't want to charge them. Does anybody ever stop you and go, "Hey, you're that poker player"? Oh yeah. You know what? Honestly, it's so strange because I would say, okay, uh, let because, me. Because I mean, that's got to be yeah. a trip after being in Hollywood. I would say seventy three percent know me from. No, I'd say eighty two percent know me from Chucky. But I say a lot of next people know me from playing poker on television, mm -hmm. and then a few people know me from Liar Liar or Liar Liar, The Getaway. I did a cult movie called Bound, which is it's a lesbian movie. So the again, lesbian Gina community. Gershon. Yeah, and she plays poker too. Mm -hmm. But they know me from Bound and also Bullets Over Broadway. Bullets Over Broadway, which I got nominated for an Oscar. Oddly enough, I don't get a lot of people recognizing me from that because. You know, people don't really go Big, out and watch Oscar, <laughs> wonderful you know, Oscar some, nominated Some people movies. are Woody Allen fans and some people aren't, yeah. you know, so that's just the way it is. Yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's a, either, but I've done so many films and... Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up my favorite Jennifer Tilly mm -hmm. movie. Uh, and I, forgive me because I have bu bugged you about this before, mm -hmm. but it's The Wrong Guy, mm. uh, written and starring another poker player, Dave Foley. Dave Foley, well, when I was on the set, and I think he was just scared of me. He was trying to stay away from me. But I was having <laughs> Well, his having character a poker... was kind of scared of you, too. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I adore Dave Foley, and I had a big crush on him, actually. I really like funny guys, and mm -hmm. he's, like, so funny. I was always trying to make him laugh on the set, but instead of laughing, he would just... It was him, Dave Steinberg, Jay Kogue, and Dave Higgins, all comedians. And, you know, I always wanted to be one of the kinds. Higgins also wrote it, too, right? Yeah, Dave yeah. Higgins and Jay Kogan wrote it. And when I would tell a joke, instead of laughing... They'd all sit around and dissect why the joke didn't work or what would make the joke better. You know, they'd be like, oh, maybe if you said the, the thing in the front. Comedy mathematicians. You know, com that's right, comedy mathematicians. And then Dave, um, Dave, he would get so anxious when I start to tell a joke. And he, and he would never, I'd say, you never laugh at my jokes. He says, I can't help it. When you start to tell a joke, I'm so worried. It's not going to be funny. I can't enjoy myself because I know you're going to get to the end of the joke and expect me to laugh. And I just, <laughs> so he, but then when I saw how anxious and uh, it would made him like, then I just did it more just to torture him. But I had a poker game going on. I taught everyone how to play poker. And I remember I was always trying to get Dave to come because, you know, he was like the big kahuna. Yeah. Everybody wanted to hang out with Dave. Kids and in the would, hall. Yeah. And he wouldn't, he would, he would say, he would say, oh, I don't know how to play poker. So actually, the World Poker Tour, which I, um, which Phil won, I remember Dave was there, and I was just hanging. I, do I busted out right away, and I was dogging his footsteps, and I remember mm -hmm. me and Mimi Rogers were sitting behind him, like, about 2 in the morning, like, watching him play, and, you know, kind of yeah. like, we're with him. And I was like, wow, he said he didn't know how to play poker. He didn't want to come to my poker game. Now he was, goes really deep, and I think he made the final table or something in the Celebrity Poker Tournament. And then he's on the Celebrity Bravo Poker Showdown with Phil Gordon. Right. So I was like, I hope I had something to do with that. 
you know. You, you planted the seed in his mind. I did. Well, the, honestly, the, Road that's, guy, the Road Guy is a great movie. That's my. And, it's my favorite comedy, I think. It's, uh, it's one I of go, my top three yeah, for sure. I go I across the Canadian breathe. border and they're all like, oh, we love, we love the movie you did. And this always the wrong guy. Yeah. They're always so nice to me. And it was a it was a really we had such a good time it was a very funny movie it was made by Hollywood Pictures which went belly up before it got released so it never really came out in the theater but it has a cult following didn't have the advertising budget yeah they, they didn't even release it the well, I, I heard. Went down. I heard I Dave on a. Mm-hmm. I heard Dave on a podcast, and he mm-hmm. was talking about how proud he was of that movie. It was like his baby, and how upset he was over mm-hmm. like you know how it did. Obviously, I don't think they released it in the theater. Exactly, I don't think it even and came out. but uh, I th- I think it's available on YouTube for free. Go watch it. Yeah. It is hilarious. Every it has it has such a cult following. Like a lot of times on my Twitter feed, people are just quoting lines from that. It's one of the movies I have to pause because I I'm bre- I'm. I can't breathe and like I'm laughing. Yeah. That happens, you know. It's like a Monty right, right. Python movie, and it's one of those things. That's kind of like a spoof on again. like uh, the Fugitive. On the Fugitive, or, yeah. But uh, yeah, uh, Dave, Dave is hysterical in it. It's a, it's really a, it's a crazy it's a crazy film. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the bracelet. Uh, can you tell me where you keep your bracelet? Do you have it on display? Well, or? I was when I won it, and you know I'm a super campy person because I, I, you know, I would always look to fill in Antonio for cues, and they'd be like, "Oh, it's super douchey to wear your bracelet." You know, you wear it <laughs> once when you win it, and then you keep it in your safe and everything. Tell us how you really feel, guys. But I, when I won it, I mean, remember all summer long, I had a whole bunch of gold bracelets, so I would put it in with the gold bracelets, and <laughs> they'd all clang together. So I'd have like my golden wrist and then i wore it whenever i went because a lot after that of course everybody wanted me to you know come to oh come to my charity my this tournament or whatever public appearances so i would wear it like if i was getting paid to appear as jennifer tilly because oddly enough people who have never won a bracelet or not in the poker world really 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 want to see the bracelet and i know i had a lot of girls like uh, poker players say yeah if i won the bracelet i would wear it all the time but i think i wore it for almost a year and then sort of the novelty wore off and <laughs> i just retired it's in my safe and um and i just really i was really happy to have it but I want to win another one, so yeah. It needs, so there. It needs uh, your other wrist is lonely. Yeah, my other wrist is lonely. <laughs> you, I want to. I want to be like two ankles too. Eric Seidel in that <laughs> full tilt poker commercial, right? Where he's, he's just clanging, clank, clank. He's wearing them all. Yeah. So, but I did. I did get my cost per wearing out of that bracelet. Uh, we got some rapid fire questions uh, mm-hmm. to close out the podcast. If you're ready mm-hmm. for you, favorite poker movie. I know you've been in a couple. Gambling Favorite movies? poker movie, The Cincinnati Kid. I think okay. it really, that long poker game towards the end, really encapsulates what it's like when you're playing those games around the clock. I remember I played one game where people took turns sleeping on the sofa. <laughs> I think Dan Balsarian and Antonio were there. and The host went to bed and then he woke up and we were still there playing. And the dealers were desperately calling all their dealer friends, like trying to find somebody else who could deal yeah. because, you know, they desperately need to sleep after 24 hours. Like. <laughs> so that's why I love the Cincinnati kid. I think I feel like it's very realistic. Kick a book. That's mm-hmm. one of my lines, my favorite lines on that one. Um, Biggest pot you ever won or lost? Your choice. Uh, the biggest pot I ever won in a home game was two hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars. Wow! Yeah, and then after that, I was really looking for an excuse to leave <laughs> because everybody just when someone that's had a, a big, big uh, loss, home game. That's a big home game. That's when, like an awkward size pot home game. You know, like like uh, everyone's like, ooh. Right. Well, you know, then everyone starts kicking it up. People, they're like, look at fucking Jennifer with half a million on the table. So everyone's like loading up because they and and, you know, the doing the straddles and everything like that because they feel like they can maybe take it back from you. And you're like, I got a thing. I was just like, <laughs> uh, lucky one of the guys had to go. And it was the guy who won the pot off of and he had to leave. And I was sort of like. Oh, you know, when he, he goes, I kind of have to, you know, because the, you know, if I took all that money off him, I have to give him a chance to get it back. It's only but, fair, yeah. Yeah, about 15 minutes after he left, I left too. I was like, you know, I've been here. Do you for remember a really the details of the hand? Was it a, just a cooler? Or? The, no, it was, I, okay, I think I was sort of, I don't know if I saw, it was, it was sort of a cooler, but it wasn't really. Um, there was a guy. Who had? You can't disclose. I don't want to say who they were. There was a guy. Who he was had, clearly a list, though. There was a guy, probably who, the most famous person in, in probably, the world. Well, yeah, there's probably a lot of people in that <laughs> game were kind of a list. So there was a guy 
who bought in for twenty thousand dollars. Never mind that Evan had a hundred thousand on the table. So he bought in for twenty, but he just I think he likes being there and be like, Oh, I'm baller, I'm playing with the baller guys. So he bought in for twenty and he did not really play. He would get up from the table, he'd wander around, he'd come back, you know, he'd fold, 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 fold. And finally, I bet he raised another luminary flat called he went all in i'm terrible at poker stories i'm terrible no he didn't go all in okay let me read let you can edit that out <laughs> rewind okay what happened is i lose I, that sound <laughs> i bet the other guy flatted the other guy okay this i do you remember your cards at least i remember my cards okay i'm gonna tell you again i'll tell i'll start this story again okay i I bet somebody, another guy flatted, the first guy raised. And it's weird. Like, people are like, oh, if I have pocket aces or pocket kings or whatever, I want the people in the hand but at a good price. So he didn't raise enough to make either of us fold. Yeah. Because the one guy flatted and then I flatted too. So now the flop comes, uh, I think, like a king high or whatever with a flush draw. I had the nut flush draw. Um, so now the the tight guy with the twenty thousand goes all in, you know. Obviously, he has aces, mm -hmm. or who knows what he has. He has he had a big over pair. Might not even come king high. I'm terrible at telling these stories. I had the nut flush draw. I was like, okay, I want to be heads up with this guy who basically made it ten thousand pre flop and ten thousand post flop or whatever it is. I don't want the other guy in. So I went all in, and I had a huge amount of. This is a terrible story because I didn't go all in because I remember money happened on the top. So I did a big re-raise to put the other guy out. So the other guy was... You're trying to isolate. I was trying to isolate. So I did a big re-raise. So the other guy was thinking about it. And um, you're like, goodbye to my tidy 45-minute podcast. So no, he, no, no. It's all good. He was thinking about it. And then I just... I knew that he didn't really have a big hat. And then all of a sudden he goes... He dropped a chip by accident. And he goes, that's a sign. He called my ginormous re-raise so now i'm just sick because all i have is a flush draw and then the turn comes a flush and then the other actor goes in quick as a flash and i'm not actor luminary and i <laughs> you know obviously i called because i had the nut flush yeah. so the other guy had a flush but not the nut flush yeah and then, then the guy who bought in for twenty thousand went up like a flat he was out the door. He didn't even rebuy. He was out the door. Before. He caused all the problems. Yeah. He's, By being he's, so short, he caused all the he problems. He started all he had to do is re-raise a decent <laughs> amount pre-flop, and neither of us would have been involved, but he did not. Uh, best swap or piece you've ever had of anybody? I have never. I, I've only, tw only twice did I have a piece of somebody, and it was, like, really weird. There was this one kid, and I, I was like, but I never really wanted to. I always feel like if. I'm losing money. I want the fun of playing the game myself. But this this one kid is really, really good, and I took a piece of him. And late in the game, in the tournament, he ended up at my table with a short stack. <laughs> and then I had this crazy dilemma because I was in a pot where I could have knocked him out. But I was like, that's my horse. It's the first horse I've mm -hmm. ever had in my entire life. I just felt like really weird. Like, what do I do? What do I do? And I was like, well, I guess I just got to play my hand. And, you know, lucky folded. But I thought, wow, that was like really weird. And that's, that's why basically how all the high rollers feel with all the swaps and stuff that they do with each other. Right. Phil was in a game once where somebody wanted to take a swap. And he was like, Phil never swaps or takes a piece well, hardly ever does. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, no, I want all my own action. And then the guy that wanted to take a piece of him had a, made a super, super marginal call against him. And he felt like, I don't know, maybe he wouldn't have made that call if he actually had a piece yeah, of yeah. me. So that's like a sort of weird kind of shadowy thing that happens in the high roller community. Um, and then the my story is when Antonio wanted us, and you know, he's a good player and everything, he's super volatile. He asked if we wanted to take a piece of him in the one drop. And we were all like, uh, no, no, no. Then I was standing in line to buy him for a tournament. And he stood in line behind me. All of a sudden, I just had this psychic flash because I'm super psychic. I went, 
fuck, Antonia's going to win the one drop. Wow. And I turned around. I go, is it too late to take a piece of you? I want to take a piece of you. And he said, no. He had a million dollars in a tray. He says, I got all my money. He said, I have it right here. I'm going to go. But I remember I just had that crazy flash. Like, I better get in on this. And then that he won the $18 million. So. Can you say how much you got? What? Can you say how much you got in for? I didn't get anything. Oh, you did. You ended up not buying no, the piece. No, he already had his million dollars. Oh, I was standing and I said I didn't want a piece, and then I was standing in line, and he wow. came and stood in line behind me, and all of a sudden I just had this. I've got to get a piece of it. Next time you have that vision, you got to act on it. Yeah, I'm. I am. <laughs> I am pretty psychic a lot of times, but you know, sometimes it helps me in poker. Sometimes it doesn't. Oh. When all the channels are clear, that's what going on tilt does. It clouds up. It's like your windshield when it's really hot inside the car, and now all of a sudden the windshield's all clouded Get up. Get that and you defogger can't see going. Yeah. Uh, that poker story was so bad. It was the worst poker story ever. Oh, you talking about your, your uh, really, really hand long. history? No, I'm terrible <laughs> at it. It was like really awful. I don't even think people even follow it. Oh, uh, no, you no, can, no. You can I, people cut it got all people out. got the gist. Flush over flush. Mm -hmm. Third guy ruined the party. Mm -hmm. uh, headphones on at the table, yes or no? And uh, I never, I love, I don't wear them in home games. I never wear them on TV. Obviously, you can't. Mm -hmm. But when I'm playing in a tournament, it really, really, you know, you've got 12 hour days. It really helps de tilt you to listen to some calming music. Mm -hmm. And then if you have a short stack and you need to go to war, you know, it's like there's a reason why they have the bugles and the guns and <laughs> everything in war mm -hmm. because then you need like marching music. You need music that's going to get you all fired up, warrior music. And a lot of times that'll help me build my small stack into a huge stack. Well, plus, it helps prevent you from talking to people like me about the wrong guy for 12 hours oh uh, well you know <laughs> i i always always like a chatty table but you know in a poker tournaments everyone's just so bitter and angry there's hardly ever <laughs> chatting going this is why i love the cash games is people are always having a good time and that's why like the high stakes cash game because i sometimes i play like the 1020 you know the bellagio or whatever mm -hmm. i don't like when some kid comes and they've got like their college education on the table like i don't like to take money from people where i feel like because i remember at the commerce it's their we, rent money yeah, yeah I, I was playing a smaller stakes and i remember there were people that i'm pretty sure were gambling with the welfare checks or just got paid and, you know and i just felt so bad about that so that's why i moved into the higher stakes too I like to win money off of people that can afford to lose it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I once won uh, about a thousand at a one-two table mm -hmm. off of a guy who ran a charity, mm. and he just finished telling me about all the kids he was mm -hmm. helping, and I felt a little bad about that one. It's funny though how fast the really nice old gentleman turns into a bitter, angry, <laughs> <laughs> Ms. chauvinistic pig. Well, what's the worst abuse you've suffered at the table? I mean, uh, most women have a horror story or two at the poker table, but you're Jennifer Tilly. It's not really women. It's not really abuse for being a woman. It's just the basic abuse that you take as a poker player. Mm. Like, I feel like... And I think it's probably because I'm older. I think if I was like a young, cute hottie, that I would have more stories like the, the young, cute hottie. You're selling yourself short stuff. again. Well, I know, but you know, I'm sorry. I've been with Phil for 17 years. I'm, you know, I'm just like sort of a stable, but I don't feel like people ever think that they're going to get into my pants, so, you know? So I think that they just don't even try. Hmm. And so I don't really have any guy was an asshole to me stories because I'm a woman. You know, I have stories like, oh, guy was an asshole to me because, you know, sometimes poker players are assholes. Yeah, because he was angry. Because <laughs> but, yeah, He was because, on tilt because he lost Because he, he was angry. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes I'll get like, oh, my, I remember one guy was so angry because when I won a big pot off of him and he didn't put me on the hand and I remember he was I had to put my earphones on because he was so mad at what I was playing like I shouldn't have been in that hand that particular hand how did you call with that yeah 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 he was like I think I have something like four seven of diamonds or whatever <laughs> and made a straight but you know because that was before I played a lot of poker I think he thought like I would only have ace queen or ace king or something I always tell girls when they're playing I have to teach a lot of people to play charity pokers I always say if an ace comes on the board bet because they always think a girl has an ace mm -hmm. but that's not true with me they always think I have nothing <laughs> <laughs> they have evidence of you playing uh, on all the streams I think so bluffing everybody I have to watch myself play and see what people think actually you know the other the uh, a few I was playing a cash game and Ollie was saying like, oh, you know, she does this da 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 da, and they've caught on to it. And I was like, oh, is that what's going on? I don't know if it's true or not, but I was like, I mix it up more, gotta mix it up more. Well, you're not the type to like go back and watch the streams to study other players or stuff like well, that. Well, I remember when I was once playing that this game in 
London that I love just called the party poker big game and it used to be 24 hour game and then they changed it to 48 hour mm-hmm. game and then the challenge was Neil Channing always wanted to play the entire time and so the challenge was to see how long you could play mm-hmm. and you know I wanted like I say I'm really competitive I love Neil Channing so I wanted to play as long as he did but then they had all the poker pros like waiting for someone to bust out so they could play so they started this thing where people get voted off the island. So they, <laughs> they asked the viewers, who do you want to see go? And I remember Neil was so mad because they voted him off. And, <laughs> you know, and it was a point of pride of him that he always lasted the whole 24 hours. And then he came back on, but he was like so mad. But I remember once they voted, um, they voted Viffer off and Viffer was stuck and, you know, and he had reloaded big. And we're like, no, not Viffer. And the thing is, <laughs> people say, oh, I hate that guy, but they don't understand. They love to hate him. He makes good television. When they, So don't vote off the guy that you hate because now it's going to be a very bland show. Yeah. So we. You need, you need an X factor in these games. We got together and we bribed somebody else to leave. And I think it was. I think it was Alec Torelli. We're like, hey, hey, will you leave instead? We all like took up a collection. He's like, sure, I'll just come back later. And but then the producers go, why is Riffer still here? He's voted off. And we go, we didn't want him to go. We we got so and so to leave instead. And he goes, no, we can't do it that way because you, you're just shitting on the <laughs> yeah, viewers. Yeah, you, you we're just saying, said, hey, viewers, remember that poll we did? None of it matters. Yeah, we're saying that you can <laughs> vote somebody off. He was voted off. They counted, they tallied the votes on the screen. He has to leave. Get him out of here. So poor but that's Dave, that's David. a thing like in a real life cash game. Mm-hmm. The guy that you want to stay, nobody's ever going to, you know, say you have to leave and somebody else has to sit down. All right. We got a few more questions left uh, so mm-hmm. I can get you out of here and Me? back back home to L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, favorite album? Music. Favorite musical album? I'm not really a big music person. Uh, you know, honestly, I love the Hamilton album for a really long time. The Hamilton time. soundtrack is one of the most it's a genius best-selling albums soundtrack. of all time. I used to love, like, if we were talking today, Eminem, when he was starting out. I don't think I have an all-time favorite album, though. I'm trying to think. No, I don't. I, I like a lot of different types of music. Well, this is a tougher question for you. Fa- okay. Favorite movie? I don't really have a favorite movie, but I'm very partial to Godfather 1 and Godfather 2. I mm-hmm. just think they're, like, such such brilliant films. We'll not we'll not talk about the third one. <laughs> the third one to me is not even part is not even part of the Godfather saga. I mean, it was a mess. They're just letting everybody. Diane Keaton was dressed it was like Diane Keaton, and, you know, Al Pacino and Sofia Coppola's making gnocchi because he's like, well, her face is kind of expressionless. We'll just do a close up on her hand making gnocchi. Mm. You know, Andy Garcia was great in that, but yeah, Godfather, wow. Uh, what about you? You didn't uh, answer poker movie. Do you have a favorite poker movie? Oh, I said the Cincinnati. Kid. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. Uh, I was going to mm-hmm. ask you about uh, Walk to Vegas. Walk to Vegas is such a great film, and I had no idea how good it would be. It, I watched it. It's just like such a joyful film, and because Vincent Van Patten is actually a gambler and a high stakes gambler and yeah. does a lot of prop bets, <laughs> it really, really rings true. I think the problem with a lot of poker movies, they're written by people who don't understand poker, or what really ticked me off about Molly's game is that all the inaccuracies, you know, and the guy who was the poker, uh, what do you call it, the person that made sure that everything was accurate, he said he would tell uh, the director, I forget who the director was, but he would tell them. Sorkin. Yeah, Sorkin. He said, he said, well, this isn't right. Like, it wouldn't happen this way or the pot or what. And Aaron Sorkin said, basically, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. He actually said, poker is so boring. Oh, I don't really care. Are you going to make a movie no, about golf actually, and not? No, we actually wrote an article about it on Card Player because he was quoted in a magazine saying, saying who cares about the poker? That's secondary. And I thought that that was so insulting. Like, are you going to play have doc, a show about doctors and have them like using the stethoscope upside down? I felt like it was very um, belittling. And um, it was of uh, the poker community. We're a real community. Mm-hmm. When they had, they were like, oh, and then I went to this CD place. Commerce Casino. Okay, Commerce Casino is plenty seedy. You don't have to put drinks and cigarettes and cigars in everybody's hand to show, oh, it's so seedy. It's been like a non-smoking casino for like the last 15 (laughs) years. And Phil is like, oh my God, no one's ever going to be having like a glass on the table, on the felt like that. And then also too, 
The props guy was so indiscriminate. He'd give a glass of white wine to an old grizzled guy. He's just running around handing out drinks to everybody. And the drinks didn't were all really Didn't fit the really character. Cool. It didn't fit the character. And I always noticed things like that. And I thought, you know, obviously... They did get some things right, you know, the sort of the home game environment was pretty accurate. But they had like, um, somebody went to Walmart and got a bunch of plastic chips. I hate movies yeah. where they're not, how expensive are real clay chips, you know? So Yeah, how I, often have you showed up to a Hollywood home game and seen chips you could buy in the store? I've never ever seen that, never. Exactly. Even when I was doing like a little sort Security of, issue. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, yeah, I mean, anybody could come in with a, a pocket full of plastic chips. So I really felt like that that movie is very insulting to the poker community, even though it was, you know, an interest. It was more a courtroom drama, I yeah. think, you know. But like, I, I, yeah, you're right, though. The hand histories are always what jut out to me in poker movies. Like, well, why does it always have to end on a royal flush? Well, that, you know what I mean? The James Bond one was the worst. And Phil's like, oh, my God, James Bond is a slow roller. Oh, Casino and, Royale. And, yeah. Casino Royale. And I said the only reason, the only time that would make sense is if everybody was cheating and he was the best cheater. But that wasn't the plot point. Yeah. Like, how could everybody have those hands? It was ridiculous. And then also... Oh, like in Solo. There was a poker scene uh, in, in a, the Han Solo movie, mm -hmm. and it was a cheat recheat situation. Mm -hmm. I was okay with that. That was in Sting, the Sting too, right? Yes. They had a cheat recheat, which I love because that's like happens. It's fine to cheat time. a cheater. You can't say that person's cheating because I'm cheating, so I know that he couldn't possibly have that hand. Exactly. So that's like a really good twist. Also, too, James Bond pushed his stack in like a little girl. We're like, isn't it supposed to be a suave bolo, you know, like international man of the world? And he just like very limp wristed pushed his and they all go tumbling in this huge stack in the overhead shot. And I know the director thought, no, that looks very cinematic. It's like, how are they ever gonna separate the chips and count them? If he doesn't win, how are they ever going? How does anybody who's ever been in a casino ever push in his stack like that? If that was a realistic scene mm. that the dealer would be yelling at right. the player, Sir! Right. <laughs> Sir! Keep your stacks even. Move your stack. Big up. chips in front. Although I actually did um, actually push my stack in like that today in Poker Co. I had a very big stack I and I went that. all in and it just toppled. But. You had made a big speech about making a tower and then two seconds later the, the tower fell over. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> can I can I just win a race for once? <laughs> and then you know, I hate when Elia Lesra chuckles like she's so adorable. She came in over the top with me, but I know my pocket nines are going to win. You know, Ellie, he's like you know, he's very when I like I enjoy playing poker with him, but he's it's very um what's the word deceiving because he seems like he's like. Oh, he's kind of cautious or knit or ABC poker guy, but he's not at all. He's super crafty. You know, he's super comes roaring back from a very small the, stack to win the, the sit and go. The kind so grandpa times. out for blood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the kindly <laughs> grandpa out for blood. Yeah. That's okay. I uh, I interviewed Ellie on this podcast, so Oh you did. I okay. can burn the, I can burn that bridge. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's a compliment, the kindly grandpa exactly. out for blood. No, that's that's honestly what every poker player is is striving for, you know. Yeah, Phil says the most dangerous, um, the most dangerous kind of player, he says it's a squeezer with moves. So it's somebody that you think is tight and then all of a sudden they're just like mm -hmm. make some sort of crazy insane bluff. But I like the people who play against their image. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like they know what they look like and they just go completely opposite. Um, Your image is always constantly changing too. That's exactly. why you always have to be conscious like how people see you or what they think of you. And I have the advantage because I do get to watch myself on TV. Although sometimes I focus on things like, like yesterday I was watching the telecast and I was like, I should have worn a better bra. <laughs> it's like I'm all over the place and I'm not talking about my poker game. So, but you know, it's funny because, you know, I came in today and one of the poker players was like a little down because of a hand he misplayed. And I felt like, wow, everybody does it. Like I'm yeah. focusing on the hands I misplayed. And a lot of times I'll have people say to me, oh, you know, you knocked me out of the tournament and you had the double, blah, blah, blah. I don't remember it. I just remember when I got knocked out of the tournament. Mm hmm. So, yeah, yeah, there's, you know, poker is like, I love poker, it's, it's living. I love poker. I love Las Vegas. I love my man, Phil. I feel good that I can share with him. But it's funny. Sometimes I'll start talking about hand histories. And my mind's like, too many numbers, too many numbers. He's really good at hand histories. He always remembers what he bet, what the other person had, what they bet, who raised. Sometimes I'll be telling a hand history. And I'll be like, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. 
you raced, and then he re-raced. I'm like, oh, yes, yes, yes. That's what I'll do. I'll have Phil in the podcast. Yeah. And he'll tell he your hand sit, history. He can sit behind me. Yeah, and he'll, he'll tell exactly <laughs> what that, I did. For that quarter and million say, pot. And then you go home, and you're like all sucky, and you're like, and then I bet, you know, to half of the pot. And he goes, no, you actually bet 32% of the pot. Like, he's all <laughs> about numbers. <laughs> uh, we end the podcast the same way every time mm-hmm. with a question from the random question generator. You mm-hmm. ready? All right. Uh, what's your favorite joke that you know from memory? Oh, Do you have a go-to? Good. Yeah, I don't really tell this joke because I usually mess it up. But this was a <laughs> joke. Uh, somebody told it. Norby Walters, uh, poker game. He goes, "Do you ever?" <clears throat> it's not really my favorite joke. I'm. Ch- it's a. I know I'm gonna mess up this joke. He goes, "Isn't it? Is it? Because it's sort of like it's a, a wandering joke." He goes, "You know, isn't it funny? Like sometimes people." On the opposite ends of the world, they'll have like the same exact thought at the same time. He goes, for example, a man stretches a very thin rope across the Grand Canyon and he starts to walk across very carefully. At the same time, a person in China has just paid a 90 year old hooker to give him a blow job. <laughs> at that moment, they both have the exact same thought. Don't look down. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that. <laughs> that's solid. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good joke. That's solid, and you delivered it accurately. But the guy told it a lot better. I forget what his name was. He was the dad in Tootsie. Oh, Charles Durning. Oh, he told the best joke. Durning, Char- when yeah. Durning, Charles Durning tells that joke, it's so much better. <laughs> but I just remembered it because, you know, it got such a big laugh when he told it. But you, you laugh politely. and Right now, there are job. thousands of people in their cars and at their Writing offices. It down. Writing it down and laughing. So Probably if Dave Foley and Steinberg and those guys are listening to it, they're figuring out how to yeah, finesse they're, it. They're the running the numbers. That they, that they can leave out. <laughs> yes, they're, they're the mathematician, the comedy mathematicians are running it through the machine. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you so much for coming thank on the you. podcast. Yes, very nice. Very nice talking to you. Thanks for having me. That's it. That's the show. Thank you to Jennifer for coming on the podcast and being a delight. You can go show Jennifer some love on Twitter and Instagram at Jennifer Tilly. And you can do the same for us at Card Player Media or at Poker underscore Stories. The series is starting soon and we have some great interviews already lined up. So make sure you hit the subscribe button and you'll get a brand new episode of Poker Stories every other week. Uh, Just please take a second to leave a rating and if you're extra nice, a review. Those who leave a review will be rewarded with a free digital subscription to Card Player Magazine. Let us know about your review with an email to pokerstories at cardplayer.com. Thanks for listening.